Welcome to New York, Quebec, and the water route to the center of the world. This is Episode 3, Colonial New York, Land of the Patroon and the Longhouse, Part Ein. From the listless repose of the place and the peculiar character of its inhabitants, who are descendants from the original Dutch settlers, this sequestered glen has long been known by the name of Sleepy Hollow, and its rustic lads are called the Sleepy Hollow Boys throughout all the neighboring country. A drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land and to pervade the very atmosphere. Some say that the place was bewitched by a high German doctor during the early days of the settlement. Others, that an old Indian chief, the prophet or wizard of his tribe, held his powwows there before the country was discovered by Master Hendrick Hudson. Certain it is, the place still continues under the sway of some witching power that holds a spell over the minds of the good people, causing them to walk in a continual reverie. They are given to all kinds of marvelous beliefs, are subject to trances and visions, and frequently see strange sights and hear music and voices in the air. The whole neighborhood abounds with local tales, haunted spots and twilight superstitions. Stars shoot and meteors glare oftener across the valley than in any other part of the country, and the nightmare, with her whole ninefold, seems to make it the favorite scene of her gambols. The dominant spirit, however, that haunts this enchanted region, and seems to be commander-in-chief of all the powers of the air, is the apparition of a figure on horseback, without a head. It is said by some to be the ghost of a Hessian trooper, whose head had been carried away by a cannonball in some nameless battle during the Revolutionary War, and who is ever and anon seen by the country folk hurrying along in the gloom of night, as if on the wings of the wind. His haunts are not confined to the valley, but extend at times to the adjacent roads, and especially to the vicinity of a church at no great distance. Indeed, certain of the most authentic historians of those parts, who have been careful in collecting and collating the floating facts concerning this specter, allege that the body of the trooper having been buried in the churchyard, the ghost rides forth to the scene of battle in nightly quest of his head, and that the rushing speed with which he sometimes passes along the hollow like a midnight blast is owing to his being belated and in a hurry to get back to the churchyard before daybreak, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. I was born and raised in New York's lower Hudson Valley. My birthplace of White Plains is located in the southern portion of modern-day Westchester County, which is situated midway on a peninsula between the mighty Hudson River to the west and the majestic Long Island Sound to the east, this at the place where the lower tip of mainland New York reaches the Great Atlantic. A vast array of islands and bays stretches to the south and east for over 100 miles, as the Hudson follows an ancient path gouged south from the northern interior. New York is a land of water from the ocean to the Great Lakes. Its natural highways have attracted and facilitated a human presence for more than nine millennia. The landscape left over from the Ice Age was shaped and molded by this water into the numerous valleys and shaded hollows of literary legend. Harvest festivals, a cornucopia of fauna, trolls, headless horsemen, and even a sleepy Dutchman of some renown filled my childhood with fantastically rich folklore. New York State is a land of incredibly diverse geographic and geological features. Starting at its most eastern point, the sandy bluffs of Montauk rise to face the Atlantic Ocean. At 120 miles long and 23 miles wide, Long Island lives up to its namesake. Still in this day of modern roads and cars, it is about a four-hour trip from end to end. The highways turn into quaint country lanes as one moves further east from modern New York City, transporting the traveler back in time. The oyster beds, brackish bays filled with seabirds, swarming schools of bluefish and striped bass, along with the great oceanic trenches filled with tuna, can still be glimpsed if you know where to look. The island itself consists of alluvial glacier sand and rock deposits barely rising above 380 feet at its highest point. On the southern shore of Long Island lies a huge network of barrier islands and inlets that mediate the effects of the Atlantic. On the northern side of the island, the glacier left a huge depression which quickly filled with seawater. The Long Island Sound separates Long Island from the modern mainland states of New York, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Various inlets and back bays line both sides. The sound is about 90 miles in length and varies widely in width between 3 to 21 miles. The western opening of the sound connects to the East River and meets the Atlantic through what is known as the Verrazano Narrows. In the midst of this natural splendor sits a magnificent sheltered harbor. 
New York Harbor is nestled between Long Island to the east, Staten Island to the southwest. And here can be found a long, hilly island soon to be situated at the center of this syncretic world. The native peoples referred to this island as Manahatta. The name is a Delaware phrase meaning hilly island or thicket where wood can be found for bows. The island of Manhattan is 13 miles long and 2 miles wide. It is built of bedrock that falls away slowly down either side. The raised middle spine of the island is not consistent, and pre-contact would have revealed noticeable valleys with numerous streams running into the east and Hudson rivers. The island's southern tip and parts of both the lower east and west sides have been considerably expanded by land reclamation efforts in modern times. As one moves north on the island, the elevation increases and the island narrows into a neck with towering cliffs above the Hudson. On its eastern side, powerful currents made passage up the East River a difficult proposition, but its lower stretches would provide excellent anchorage, and it's this location that would eventually be the site of New Amsterdam's bustling docks. Separated a few hundred yards from the mainland by a tidal creek, now known as the Harlem River, Manhattan was a rocky fortress protected by a watery natural moat. Stretching north up the west side of the island was a mighty river filling in deep glacial canyons. Called the North, Orange, and eventually the modern-day Hudson, the river starts in the high peaks of the Adirondack Mountains and flows 315 miles south into New York Harbor. Let's take an imaginary trip up the Hudson, sitting in the protected harbor between Manhattan, Long Island, and Staten Island. We have two choices, sailing north out of New York Harbor, one would pass the island of Manhattan on your right and begin to glimpse the mighty basalt cliffs of the Palisades on your left. The modern state of New Jersey or the patroonship of Pavonia would also occupy the view on your left-hand side at this point. The Dutch had settled the riverine counties of modern-day northern New Jersey and formed isolated strongholds of farmsteads in the hilly terrain of Bergen County. Passing the northern tip of Manhattan, one could glimpse the boiling waters of Spiten Dival or Devil's Whirlpool, at the point in which the Harlem River met the Hudson. The dangerous tidal currents caused many ships attempting the passage into the East River to flounder in the rocky shoals. These would not be properly cleared until the 19th century. The Harlem River would be straightened and deepened by a modern shipping canal later. The shallow tidal creek that would have been glimpsed during our narrative period was the site of a Dutch folkloric legend. The mighty moss bunker guarded the passage across. A chimera of man and fish, the creature was said to drag unsuspecting travelers to their doom under the swirling muddy waters. This would become the main site to cross on foot north out of Manhattan and would become the location of the King's Bridge, the main route taken by the Broadway, or modern Route 9 that starts at the foot of New York Harbor. Back on the Hudson and sailing north, one would glimpse parts of the modern-day borough of the Bronx and the city of Yonkers, it was here where the Nepperhand Kill or Sawmill River met the Hudson. This will be the center of the Phillips's family manorial lands. The river's width stays constant until the Tappan Zee, or Sea of the Tappan people. It's here on your right that the legendary village of Sleepy Hollow could be seen. This site would be anchored by the Phillips Upper Grain Mill and Old Dutch Church. To your left would be Rockland County. On your right, you would pass a hooked peninsula called Croton Point, where the river widens to 3.2 miles across at Haverstraw Bay. Decreasing in width at Verplank, New York, on the right side going north, the Hudson begins to make a sharp left turn at Peekskill and will tip our hat to the imp king of Dunderberg for safe passage. A sharp right at Bear Mountain and then a sharp left at West Point would bring us to the Wind Gate, or northern exit from the Hudson Highlands. Moving further north, the river widens a bit again at Newburgh on the left bank and Beacon on the right. The river narrows as one passes Poughkeepsie to the east and widens again at Kingston or Wiltwick on the western bank. Wiltwick, or the future Kingston, would act as the gateway to the Catskill Mountains. Wiltwick wasn't referred to by the ill-sounding name of Wildtown for nothing. It was a small stockaded village developed at the tail end of Dutch rule, but would be the site of some of the most intense combat the colony of New Netherlands would witness. The river continues to narrow as we make our way north, but retains its brackish water composition until Beaverwick, or the future Albany. Surrounding the future Albany, the original patroon ship of Rensselaerswick filled in both sides of the river. The Dutch settlement of Schenectady lies to the northwest and was positioned as a gateway to the Mohawk Valley. 
Here one could find the confluence of the Mohawk and the western route onto the Great Lakes through a portage at modern-day Rome, New York. At the Great Carrying Place, boats could move between Wood Creek, Lake Oneida, the Oswego River, and onto Lake Ontario. Back on the river and passing Saratoga, we near Fort Edward, where one could find a 15-mile portage northeast to Lake George and eventually to the St. Lawrence via Lake Champlain and the Richelieu River. Above this point, the Hudson narrows and becomes impassable due to falls. To the north lies a large mountain range called the Adirondack Mountains in the shape of a 5,000 square mile circular dome resting over northern New York. The result of fairly recent uplift in the Earth's crust, the Adirondacks are still rising to this day. Mount Marcy in the High Peaks region is the tallest point in New York State at 5,344 feet. Lake Tier of the Clouds on Mount Marcy's southern slope is the source of the Hudson River. Directly west, jutting toward the junction of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, is a plateau gouged by glacial ice forming the Finger Lakes and rerouting rivers to fill the Great Lakes. This fortuitous act of nature completed the all-important waterway link to the west. It was upon these waterways that the English explorer Henry Hudson mapped out what would become the new Dutch colony of New Netherlands in 1609. It would flourish for almost 60 years, stretching from the shores of Long Island and up the Great North River to the trading post at Orange or modern-day Albany, New York, and southwest to Delaware and east to the Connecticut River. It was centered around the small city of New Amsterdam, founded on the tip of Manhattan. Adrian van der Donk, an aide and scout to the patroon Van Rensselaer, painted a beautiful picture of this land. The mountains to the north of Rensselaerwick loomed like a dreamscape. The forest beggared imagination, so much so that practically the whole country is covered in it, yet the winters were of such ferocity that the entire expanse typically froze over every December. April and May were the finest months because the trees were in bloom and the woods full of sweet smells. We have ripe strawberries that grow wild in the fields. In autumn above the highlands, advancing northernly, the weather is colder, the fresh waters freeze. The Dutch Republic that would give birth to this new colony was a newly independent democratic experiment. Born in the Calvinist fires of the Reformation and battle tested against the might of the Spanish Habsburg Empire. Led by a democratic confederation in a body called in the States General, the Dutch had achieved de facto independence since the late 1580s. Toleration was a policy that furthered Dutch economic aspirations and built upon their strong maritime history. This combination of real politic and a wealth of institutional knowledge in commerce and warfare would allow the Dutch to transform the Atlantic world by transitioning imperial goals from controlling trade to management of commodity production, according to historian Wim Klooster. The Dutch would seek to supplant the empire of their former Spanish overlords and imprint their unique cultural attributes on the lands they conquered in the New World. Dutch forces couldn't penetrate the vast interior of the Spanish Empire in order to seize the source of the hard bullion that filled Habsburg coffers, so they began to populate the fertile, literal land with a plantation society based on African slavery. Dutch merchants were becoming familiar with this system from the outer Caribbean islands, abandoned by the Spanish and the West African slaving factories operated by Iberian powers. The Dutch East India Company, or the VOC, would help establish the modern concept of triangle trade and familiar pattern of exchange in an ever-escalating war of conquest fueled by the profits of sugar from about 1600 to 1670. New Netherlands would grow to become an administrative center of the Dutch New World Empire, connected to islands like Curaçao, Dutch Brazil, and colonies like Berbice on the wild north coast of South America. In 1596, the first recorded Dutch slaving voyage landed 130 Angolan captives in Zeeland. This human cargo was seized from a Portuguese vessel that was now fair game due to the Union of Crowns in Iberia. The Portuguese would become prime targets for the Dutch in the slave trade and eventually even the plantations of Brazil itself would fall into their hands. Those in bondage owned by the WIC in New Amsterdam would also come directly from these same interdicted Portuguese slaving routes. The 130 enslaved Angolans were freed when it was discovered that all were Christians based on previous contact with the Portuguese. This, according to historian Linda Rupert, it was into this hyper-partisan atmosphere 
that an English sea captain by the name of Henry Hudson had first proposed a voyage over the northern top of the globe to cut travel time to China. Early English exploration of the North American coastline and founding of a colony at Jamestown in 1607 helped provide a rudimentary map that Hudson could develop to begin his exploration inland. Native contact had provided stories of vast northern oceans that could be used to access the interior, and now we most likely think they were referring to the Great Lakes. The Spanish had claims to the Carolinas, and the British were firmly ensconced in New England. But the area between the Delaware River and New Haven, Connecticut, had been sparsely claimed by a European power by the start of the 17th century. Hudson was hotly pursued by the French as well, but the VOC was convinced that this new river route spoken of by local natives must be explored. A colonial venture that was safe from Spanish attack could serve as a naval harbor and entrepot for inland commodities to be sent on to Europe. Sugar products could also be sold here and food grown to feed slaves of the Caribbean. On April 4, 1609, Hudson and a crew of 16 set sail for the New World on a ship named the Half Moon. Hudson followed a route pioneered by English Captain John Smith, which saw his tiny ship arc across the North Atlantic until sighting Newfoundland in July and staying within sight of the eastern Atlantic seaboard by passing Cape Cod at the beginning of August. Hudson sailed until he reached the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay on August 18th. Here he would reorient himself and move north up the coast until he reached the mouth of the Delaware River on August 27th. He was the first European to explore the Delaware, but the bay presented dangerous sandbars and the half moon could proceed no further upriver. Hugging the New Jersey coast until they rounded Sandy Hook on September 2nd and sighted what is now known as New York Harbor one day later. Upon landing on the southern shore of Staten Island, Hudson's men were met by the local Delaware-speaking peoples. Historian Russell Shorto recounts a generational encounter tale, finally written down in 1801. A large house of various bright colors was seen floating on the water. The newcomers were dressed in red coat, all glittering with gold lace. Hudson and his crew made the rounds of Brooklyn, Staten Island, and the New Jersey coastline. Finally settling into New York Harbor, one of Hudson's crewmen wrote, the river is a mile broad and there is very high land on either side, just as likely a channel into the other side of the world that one could hope for. Sadly, this new river would not turn out to be a channel to the east, but still provided access to the interior for more than 150 miles. The upper river valley was populated heavily by dense villages made up of longhouses constructed of circular bark. Natives were killed in minor skirmishes, mostly downriver nearer to the coast, as Hudson kept a keen eye out for a hot commodity back in Europe. The land was filled with furred animals of every kind, and especially beaver. Mohican tribes that he had encountered up the newly named North River demonstrated a wealth of pelts and signaled there were plenty more to be found. This is all Hudson needed to sell the new colony to investors interested in feeding fur-hungry Europe. Though Hudson would later die ingloriously set adrift in the Arctic Ocean, his venture, now called New Netherlands, would continue to grow slowly. At this point in our narrative, I wanted to introduce a quick aside. It's an event that nicely illustrates the syncretic nature of this changing world right after the moments of contact. Juan Rodriguez Way is a 50-street stretch of Broadway in Upper Manhattan, named after the island's first non-native settler. Four years after Henry Hudson surveyed the area, a VOC employee named Juan Rodriguez demanded to be left ashore. Rodriguez agreed to forfeit any pay or future claims against the company and was given some trade items to bring with him. He managed to meet up with the next Dutch vessel and exchange procured furs to be sold on in Europe. The return of VOC officials saw them attempt to enslave Rodriguez as he had now turned into a competitor. He resisted and was gravely wounded, but was saved by native friends he had made from the time on the island. Native medicine helped him heal, and he eventually married into the local Delaware bands. His large family helped him pursue the fur trade, and he later served as an interlocutor between European traders and native peoples, all towards securing pelts. Modern Dominican residents of Washington Heights have latched on to his wonderful story of syncretism, and his name graces the stretch of Broadway that runs through the neighborhood. Historians have surmised he most likely was a creolized former slave from the island of Hispaniola. He came into the Dutch world by way of a raid on Spanish shipping. Juan's story connects the birth of New Amsterdam to the wider geopolitical situation of the Atlantic Basin and gives us a good insight into this rapidly developing syncretic world. Up the Great North River, 
Beaverwick was founded in 1614 at the present-day site of Albany, New York. The previous year, several Dutch scouts had encountered the powerful Iroquois League and committed to a covenant chain. This peace agreement stipulated the mutual cooperation of the two peoples and would serve to bind the powers at Albany to the League for more than 150 years. Though Beaverwick only contained 50 residents six years later, the pelts had begun to flow. Still, the Dutch hadn't realized the true extent of Iroquois League power and made the mistake of disregarding the earlier covenant chain to ally with the Algonquin-speaking Mohicans against the Mohawk. They quickly learned where the regional power lay. When a military request for aid against the Mohawk was brought to their northern outpost on the Hudson in the summer of 1626, Violating the explicit orders of the WIC, the Dutch commander at Fort Orange assembled a party of seven men to march off into oblivion. Mohawk warriors ambushed the combined Dutch and Mohican force and handed them a catastrophic defeat. All the Mohican warriors and half of the small Dutch party were slain in the battle. Fort Orange's commander Daniel Van Crickenbeek was among the dead, as the Mohawk boiled a Dutch captive alive. Fort Orange was spared a further attack and the Mohawk withdrew satisfied with their show of force. Expiration of a truce with the Spanish had opened the door to privateering and the looting of Spain's New World possessions. Financiers cobbled together the Dutch West India Company stock trading venture in 1623, or the WIC. The company intended to use the northern port as a repair and restock point on the journey back across the Atlantic to Europe. They also envisioned the fertile hinterland providing food for the sugar-rich colonies of Brazil, and those in the Caribbean. Dutch colonists struggled to develop a stable colony on what is now Governor's Island. Recently arrived colonists under Governor General Peter Minweet moved across the water to the tip of a long and hilly island called Manahatta, or the future Manhattan. The new Governor General was from a family of Protestant Walloons who had been driven out of their home by the Spanish. Dutch colonists would be recruited from the vast pool of religious refugees and political asylum seekers who had flooded the Republic during the recent wars. Records include Sephardic Jews, French Huguenots, and Portuguese-speaking Malagasy slaves, all intermingled with those members of the Dutch Reformed Church on the future muddy streets of New Amsterdam. Here the polyglot of Europeans would have encountered bands of Lenape Indians who would have not permanently called the island home, but used it as a hunting and fishing grounds on a seasonal basis. The island, many coves and bays, provided excellent shellfish habitat, and the wooded hills ran thick with beaver, wolf, and bear. It was there on the southern tip of what author Russell Shorto had entitled The Island at the Center of the World that a small group of natives sold the deed to the future New York City. The transaction can be read as follows. High and mighty lords, my lords the states general at The Hague, yesterday arrived here the ship, the arms of Amsterdam, which sailed from New Netherland out of the river Mauritius on the 23rd of September. They report our people are in good heart and live in peace there. The women also have borne some children there. They have purchased the island of Manhattan from the Indians for a value of 60 guilders. It is 11,000 morgans in size, 24,000 acres. They had all their grain sowed by middle of May and reaped by the middle of August. They send thence samples of summer grain such as wheat, rye, barley, oats, buckwheat, canary seed, beans, and flax. The cargo of the aforementioned said ship is 7,246 beaver skins, 675 otter skins, 48 mink skins, 36 wildcat skins, 33 mink skins, 34 rat skins, along with considerable oak and hickory timber. This famous land exchange is a sort of New York City birth certificate as author Russell Shorto styled it. Native view on land possession seems staked to some type of lease agreement through which a diplomatic exchange might be cemented. The local natives would be quite astonished were they refused access for their seasonal hunting and fishing forays they made to the island after the purchase was complete on November 5, 1626. Native agency was actually felt right from New Amsterdam's birth as the original inhabitants didn't leave and nor were they forced to. Early land deals in New Netherlands included gathering access and even required rent in the form of food supplement to natives. Now the other misconception concerns the 60 guilders or relative modern value of $24. Besides the obvious difference in purchase power, Shorto points out that most miss the actual text. The text states value of 60 guilders, as the natives would have no use for the hard currency. 
they would have been given goods and products that would have equaled in their estimation to 60 guilders of worth. Shorto's research has found that many local deals for the next 20 years were found to equal this value per acre, even between Dutchmen. Goods exchanged in the deals usually included manufactured metal tools, animal pelts, and farmland produce. While a lively trade in land and animal pelts was developing, a poorly maintained fort and several hundred colonists clung to the southern tip of Manhattan Island. The precarious position of the colony was improved slightly under the leadership of Peter Minwheat. Houses were constructed along the faint outline of the future Broadway. The route followed a native trail northwest and would later be developed into the modern New York State Route 9. One can now drive from the tip of Manhattan to Canada following this ancient path. The poorly constructed fortress stood astride the harbor on the footprint of the modern Native American Museum and would never be able to stand a proper European siege. The Dutch settlers were not as numerous as their English neighbors to the north or south, but what the Dutch lacked in manpower or static formidable defense, they made up for by the freewheeling composition of their society. Their concentration on the economic aspects of the colonial venture allowed New Amsterdam to experience a tiny trickle from the tsunami of ideas and peoples flowing forth from the Dutch Republic experiment. The Dutch East India Company, or VOC, had sponsored the original geographic scouting of the colony, but a Dutch West India Company, or WIC, was constituted to run New Amsterdam along lines of profit. While founded in 1621, the new financial institution didn't make its impact known in the colony until the 1630s with land-grant schemes because the Dutch Republic's strategy of attacking Spanish possessions in South America and the Caribbean throughout the second decade of the 17th century began to pay off. The age of privateering saw massive investment in relieving the Catholic Habsburgs of their gold-laden burden. This focus on seaborne enterprises delayed the civil development of New Amsterdam for about a decade. The financial nature of the colony venture, coupled to the fact that New Amsterdam was a company town, led to hard scrabble and ad hoc decisions being implemented as New Amsterdam grew. The local shell currency of wampum was adopted from the Algonquin natives and was used in exchange for furs or livestock. To increase the profits and populate New Netherlands further, the WIC implemented the patroon system. Essentially, this was a land-grant system that required the receiver to populate and develop tracts for settlers. The development of patroon ships around Manhattan, Staten Island, Long Island, and the Hudson Valley would not go unnoticed by the English crown. The dangerously inconvenient geographical position of the colony wedged between Virginia to the south and halting Puritan southerly advances from the north, caused much distress amongst English subjects. Dutch control over the Delaware, Hudson, and Connecticut river valleys was seen as an affront to British commercial interests by denying them access to the fur-rich northern interior. The geographic value of New Amsterdam was becoming undeniable by the 1630s, as it commanded one of the longest inland waterways in the northeast, directly linked to the ocean. Access from the northeast interior to the center of the northern Atlantic colonial world was quickly becoming a valuable attribute to the burgeoning young colony. The post at Fort Orange, or the future site of modern-day Albany, was the key to Dutch access to the fur trade. Situated near the confluence of the Hudson and Mohawk rivers, which led west toward the Great Lakes or north to Canada, Fort Orange was fast becoming a lucrative fur trading entrepot. Beaver pelts, and especially the underlying layer used for felt, were a must-have accoutrement for any European on the make. Trading forays and diplomacy were essential to maintaining the goodwill of the Mohawk and larger Iroquois Confederacy. Astonished at the great sophistication of their government structures and neatly laid out villages replete with longhouses, the Dutch continued negotiations with the League as to the price per pelt. French incursions from Quebec had provided the Iroquois with the leverage needed. Over the winter of 1634, the League strong-armed Dutch agents into a set price for each beaver pelt procured. Shorto provides a translated native chant sang by the assembled confederation to mark this new commercial relationship. The white man is a magician. He has leave to go around to all the Mohawk, Oneida Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca to go lie safely among them. This is a useful thing for the Iroquois League. Through the song, we are able to glimpse the foundational moments after contact and witness native agency governing these early transactions 
Downriver New Amsterdam was growing by 1630, helped by the willingness to serve as a clearinghouse for both legal and ill-gotten loot taken by privateers in the Caribbean basin. After early disagreements amongst the governing board of the WIC concerning the value of patroon ships, the first major land grant was doled out to the Dutch diamond merchant Van Rensselaer in 1630. Patroons were required to supply their hereditary estates with colonists over the age of 15 to become tenants. In exchange for populating the colony, they retained judicial jurisdiction, the right to found churches, vital record-keeping duties, and received feudal dues. All of this was laid out in the 1629 Charter of Privileges and Exemptions, which was ratified by the States General. The Charter allowed for a 10-year tax holiday for any tenants willing to settle, but refused the right of movement during that time period to encourage growth. Trade was sanctioned with New France and New England, but a 5% export tax must be paid first. Tenants could not sell anything produced without first offering it to the patroon, as the Lord was required to front the cost of basic infrastructure. The Charter also required that any land claimed by natives must be bought and not seized from them. In addition, patroons gained the right to use slave labor imported by the WIC on their landed estates. The company was also made responsible for the defense of the patroonship and their inhabitants. Estates were claimed from the Delaware to the Connecticut River, and even down in the Southern Caribbean to Brazil. Most would soon be underwater, financially speaking, or subject to attack by enemies. Only those in the Hudson Valley region would survive the British takeover, albeit in different legal form. The Rensselaer family would outlast the Dutch and British eras and mark the end of their rule in upstate New York almost 200 years later. This first patroon would never set foot in New Netherlands, but nevertheless chose his grant wisely. His land sat astride the North or Hudson River and surrounded the village of Beaverwick, or the future Albany. After paying the local Mohican residents to move off their land, Rensselaerswick had more than 100 residents by 1641. The patroon system gave the colony some initial hope, but New Netherlands was facing growing pressures. The English pushed south from New England to settle at Hartford in 1636 on the Connecticut River, and a ghost from the past returned to haunt them by challenging WIC claims to the Delaware. A disgraced Peter Minwheat had been exiled in 1632 for allegedly helping patroon lords skirt taxation through illegal import regimes. He returned to North America in 1638, but not in the service of the Dutch. He returned at the helm of a small Swedish fleet that sought to exploit the light settlement footprint of the WIC on the Delaware. Settling at modern-day Wilmington, the Swedes would challenge Dutch claims for another 17 years in the region. By 1640, New Netherlands faced a crisis of currency inflation, meager government structure, and rising amounts of violence between settlers and native peoples. Wampum, or sea want currency, used in everyday cultural transactions, was becoming devalued due to the influx of shoddy lower quality shells. Regulation was put forth to set the quality of wampum in polished form and the exchange rate of lesser wampum to the high quality version. Director General William Kieft arrived in 1638, but had never lived in the colony before ascending to his post. He was also facing declining profits, as the WIC had relinquished the monopoly on furs by 1639 and opened the trade up to individual colonists. They exercised a 10% tax on every pelt sold. But the change was not hitting the balance sheets yet. The other costly sector that drained the finances of New Netherlands was defense. The WIC provided soldiers to protect settlers, patroon ships, and friendly native tribes through land deals. Hoping to co-opt natives into defraying the cost through taxation, Kiff found resistance rooted in the original land deals. Taking advantage of a local instance of thievery by the Raritan natives on Staten Island in 1641, Dutch forces were sent out to arrest the alleged perpetrators and killed several Raritans. This led to a retaliatory attack that killed four Dutchmen, but a bribe had resulted in the killing of the offending Raritan chief. The conflict seemed to be ebbing when another member of a local Algonquin band took the moment to exact some long-simmering revenge. A decade prior, the young native man's uncle was slain by a local Dutchman in a drunken dispute, so he returned the favor in this heightened time of communal tension. The killing gave the director general all the motive he needed to launch large-scale attacks against local Algonquin bands in the lower Hudson Valley. Author Russell Shorto describes this moment as when 
the first popularly chosen body in what would become New York State came into existence. The war called for popular effort and great physical exertion on the part of the Dutch colonists, so an advisory council of 12 leading settlers was chosen. The council was tasked with justification and persecution of the war effort, but sought a diplomatic approach instead of violence. They agreed that those natives involved in recent crimes are both subject to and should face Dutch justice under the laws of the colony charter. They refused to endorse a ruinous war that would certainly bring pain upon the outlying patroon ships and isolated farmsteads. Ignoring their pleas, company soldiers ranged out to confront Algonquin bands across the river in the patroon ship of Pavonia located near modern-day Jersey City. Large-scale massacres helped forge the disparate native bands into a confederation. This confederation devastated patroon ships on both sides of the Lower Hudson from 1643 to 1644. Manhattan Island was raided and refugees huddled into Fort New Amsterdam for safety. Director General William Kieft faced a popular revolt by spring of 1644 due to the widespread despoilment of the surrounding countryside. Faced with empty coffers, he suggested an additional tax on beaver pelts and tankards of beer. Petitions were drafted and sent to the state's general, outlining novel ideas with hints of taxation without representation, but this was ignored by the leaders of the Dutch Republic. Angered by the destruction of the colony and baffled by his lack of military leadership in the field, William Kieft was recalled. The Algonquin Confederacy was defeated by 1645 after English mercenary captains killed hundreds in a campaign of intimidation. English immigration was lending a helping hand to the colony because of the Puritan conflict roiling England. English Puritans sought refuge in the Netherlands, with some migration occurring from disaffected splinter groups in New England. Anne Hutchison is the most famous of the religious dissidents to call New Netherlands home. She was killed during the conflict with the Algonquin Confederation started by Governor General Kieft at her home in Pelham Bay. Today she is memorialized with both a parkway and elementary school named in her honor in the area. English settlement would continue to grow and eventually make up 20% of the entire population of New Netherlands. This group was concentrated on the eastern end of Long Island and filled a temporary need for manpower, but their dubious loyalty would soon become apparent. It's at this time in our narrative where I'd like to provide some deeper insight into the societal development and structure of life in New Netherlands. Let's start with some descriptions of New Amsterdam by historian Jean Zimmerman. Manhattan has the shape of a herring. Originally a rather narrow herring, its perimeter having not yet been bulked out by the landfill that would come to comprise one-third of the lower island, the herring's pointed head faced south as if it would swim out toward the Atlantic Ocean. The settlement of New Amsterdam stood square on the fish's head, with streets laid out over a fraction of the island's 22 square miles of rock, lakes, streams, and forest. In the summer of 1659, a nearly unbroken carpet of green stretched across all of Manhattan and the land masses that had encircled it, mainland New York, New Jersey, Long Island, and Staten Island, punctuated by a handful of farms across the wider landscape and a few scratched out streets at the island's base. Zimmerman also gives us a wonderful picture of the cityscape itself. Here, New Amsterdam had a population of about 2,000 and boasted one hospital, one bake shop, one grist mill, one midwife, one church, and 21 taverns. Many of the cramped and smoky tap houses huddled close by the harbor along a section of Pearl Street called the Strand. There, shipwrights plied their trade and restored weather-beaten craft. Walking west along Pearl Street brought one into the heart of town. A newcomer could reliably find a mason, cooper, or glazier here. The blocks radiating from the Strand housed many of the town's mechanics, laborers, and craftsmen. Carpenters, hatters, and tailors operated out of home workshops in the area. Representatives of seaborne trades like gunners, sailors, pilots, and supercargoes also lived shoulder to shoulder in this crowded harbor. Trade goods were hoisted by crane to second-story storage areas and warehouse complexes straight from the canals. On Sundays, settlers would gather for worship in the Dutch Reformed Church, tucked safely inside Fort Amsterdam, situated on the tip of Manhattan. Here, parishioners and soldiers alike would fill the collection plate with sawan or wampum, this shell currency of the native Delaware was adopted and widely used in every economic facet throughout New Netherlands. New Netherlands had a legal marriage structure similar to British coverture, in which a wife would subsume her identity outside of the household under the auspices of the husband. Dutch law also included another form of marriage called usus. 
Essentially, this was a prenuptial agreement that separated the previous wealth of two partners and maintained the legal individuality of each. The Grand Phillips dynasty was built upon such egalitarian societal opportunities found under New Netherlands law. The educational standards of the Dutch left their mark on the colony of New Netherlands and its successor state of New York. The Dutch Reformed Church and local municipalities partnered to offer education for six-year terms on average. The wealthy and business elite would continue education after the age of 12 in both language and math. The first paid instructor arrived in 1624, and Peter Stuyvesant later provided educational instruction to the children of WIC company slaves. At the tail end of New Netherlands' existence, 66% of men and 49% of women in Albany could sign legal documents with their name. 50 years later, and that number had risen to 86% for men and 50% for women in English New York. Large schools existed in Albany by the 1740s. Several hundred mostly Dutch-descended boys and girls attended lessons. The New Netherlands Dutch held on to a strong tradition of kindermail. This celebration of the newborn child and parents doesn't exist in modern-day Netherlands. An entire day of downing Ole Kuchen, Dutch donuts, and drinking a strong hot brew of Madeira, sugar, oats, and raisins commenced to mark the occasion. Delivered by a professionally trained midwife on W. I. Company pay, infant mortality still ranged between 30 to 40 percent. Celebrations were therefore always in order. Carl Carmer shared his descriptions of some popular games played in New Netherlands. The first game is called Cat Clubbing and consists of a cat imprisoned in a cask and suspended from a rope. The participants would throw wooden clubs at the cask until the winner freed the cat. The second one is called Pulling the Goose, and this consisted of a goose hung upside down with its neck greased. Suspended by rope across the road, a rider would gallop at full speed and attempt to pull the goose free. Now let's return to our final governor general and the fate of New Netherland. The colony was in need of strong military leadership, and so an able but authoritarian soldier by the name of Peter Stuyvesant arrived in 1647. A decorated soldier who lost a leg in a failed assault on the island of St. Martin, Stuyvesant would serve until the English conquest in 1664. He brought a Calvinist zeal to tackling what we now call quality of life crimes, like knife fighting or drunkenness on the Sabbath. He was also deeply suspicious of the independent streak shown by the colonists during the tenure of his predecessor. In the words of Shorto, Stuyvesant was smart, deep, honest, and narrow. He had little knowledge of intellectual currents in the wider Dutch world, let alone the wider European world. The situation had the making of a showdown. This confrontational approach would color the entirety of Stuyvesant's director generalship and leave him without friends when true danger to the colony finally came calling. He insisted that the previous popular councils exercised illegitimate power and packed a new council with eight of his supporters. His power cemented, Stuyvesant sought to come to a truce with the New England colonies. He then pivoted to the upstart Swedish colony to the south. The Swedes had reinforced their colony on the Kill or Hidden River. Stuyvesant rebuilt and restocked Dutch forts in an effort to build a power base from which a future attack would come from. His authoritarian style led him to be at loggerheads with even his own hand-picked board or council. Board members sought to counter his self described princely powers by petitioning the states general to grant municipal status to New Amsterdam. In 1650, a ruling was issued giving the city its charter and making the civil council the ruling civic body. Stuyvesant worked hard to settle and preserve a border. This was agreed upon in conjunction with the leaders of New England in the Hartford Accord of 1650. The territory was split by a north to south line giving the eastern half of Long Island and all territory east of Greenwich, Connecticut to the English. This would create a firm administrative and cultural line that would preserve the Dutch influence in future New York State. Stuyvesant came close to recall, but Oliver Cromwell intervened and the first Anglo-Dutch war commenced. New Netherland geared up to host privateering expeditions and the Dutch could use the military experience of the Director General when a raid against the English colonies to the north and south. The modern New York City dates its founding to February 2, 1653, when the Municipal Charter was finally proclaimed in New Amsterdam. The Municipal Charter set in motion further popular resistance to company rule and helped organize recent English settlers against Stuyvesant. The Navigation Acts enacted by the English Crown continued to stalk the prospects of New Amsterdam, though. 
The development of a national transportation monopoly for English shipping forced the English crown to focus on the new world targets of Jamaica and the island of Manhattan. A massive fleet had recently arrived from England and was resupplying in Boston when word of peace saved the colony in 1654. Beaverwick was given official status by Stuyvesant and had grown to be New Netherland's second largest city by 1660 with 1,000 inhabitants and its public square at the junction of John Keir and Handler taking shape. Still, the future Albany was subject to the spring floods and lashed by the harsh northern winters. Manhattan began to take shape with its wall and canal appearing during this period, and buildings began to be constructed in stone. Russell Shorto points out that the idea of medieval citizenship for individual residents was firmly planted in the New World through New Amsterdam's great and small burghers. By 1664, 300 African slaves called New Amsterdam home and lived in various stages of servitude conditions. The Hudson Valley around Wiltwick was experiencing strife with the local native population in what was known as the Esopus War. This brutal local conflict of attrition would not be settled until several months before the English would supplant the Dutch in 1664. Stuyvesant's director generalship covered the modern-day islands of Aruba, Bonaire, and the slave market island of Curaçao, which he managed from afar through correspondence. He commanded a fleet that forced the surrender of New Sweden and secured the Delaware River Valley in 1655. The next conflict with the English began in 1664. King Charles intended to end the inconvenient geographic position of the Dutch. He would ensure the navigation acts were respected by southern English colonial shipping and gain access to the interior fur trade. Three English warships and 300 men rallied discontented English settlers on Long Island. Outnumbered two to one and facing a full-scale rebellion on the island, Stuyvesant climbed the ramparts of Fort Amsterdam to resist, but was forced to relent as the leading citizens of New Amsterdam called on him to surrender. The English then attacked Dutch garrisons in the Delaware Valley and sold the surrendering soldiers into indentured servitude in Virginia. Though New Netherland would be briefly reconquered in 1673 by the Dutch, their rule in North America had come to an end. The Dutch allowed the English to keep what was now known as New York in exchange for Surinam in 1664. During the Third Anglo-Dutch War, the Dutch arrived again in New York Harbor in 1673 with 600 troops and eight warships. The Dutch naval flotilla opened fire on the old Fort Amsterdam and Dutch troops encircled the fortification from the landward side. The city was renamed Fort Orange and Dutch became the official language of the courts and law once more. For 18 months, Dutch authorities fortified the wall surrounding the city, constructed fortified docks, and repaired the main fort. When the treaty ending the war was signed in 1675, England was once again returned to power in New York. Dutch colonists were persecuted for supporting the brief re-establishment of Dutch colonial rule when the British returned to power. Previous lenient agreements that would resemble the Quebec Act of later generation allowed the Dutch cultural freedom after the initial 1664 English takeover. Now English crown authorities stripped the Dutch language of any official use demoted the Dutch Reformed Church, and excluded women from inheritance and business ventures. Dutch widows now received a third instead of half their husband's fortune. Sons now received the family inheritance instead of daughters. So the Dutch withdrew to the Hudson Valley and created insulated ethnic communities far from English power in New York City. Patroonships were transferred and reaffirmed through a new allegiance to the English crown. Legally speaking, the English changed the name of the system from a patroonship to a ducal or manor system. The Van Rensselaer patroonship was the last major holdover from the Dutch era, and their land grant was renewed by the English overlords. The Van Rensselaer manor refers to the arrangement with English authorities post-1664. The expansion of the English manor system included the founding of several great manors throughout the Hudson Valley. The Phillips dynasty would accumulate a vast swath of southern Westchester County and holdings in the Mid-Hudson region. The Livingston Manor was created in 1686 and at 160,000 acres, stretched from the Hudson to Massachusetts in modern-day Columbia County, New York. Van Cortland Manor was granted in 1697 and spanned 86,000 acres across all of modern-day northern Westchester County. The Hardenburg Manor was granted in 1708 and at 1.5 million acres, 
was the largest land transaction of the New York colonial period. This mighty manor comprised much of the modern Catskill region of New York State. Only the Van Rensselaer's manor lasted through the American Revolution and the early Republic. Though the creation of New York State during the Revolution led to many traditional feudal powers being stripped, manor owners still retained great influence. The last true patroon was finally stripped of power in 1839 by New York State over disagreements concerning tenant rents. The last lord of the manor, Stephen Rensselaer IV, had inherited properties worth between 30 to 40 million in today's dollar value, but managed to lose it all by seeking to collect on that debt to realize such astronomical valuations. New York Dutch continued to be spoken throughout the Hudson Valley with immigrants assimilating from their native tongue until after the start of the 18th century. Anglicans in New York remarked in 1699 that the colony seemed rather like a conquered foreign province held by the terror of a garrison than an English colony. That same year, the New York colonial governor commented that the Dutch could neither speak nor write proper English. Albany was still a Dutch city in the 1850s, and the language could be found in isolated pockets of northern New Jersey and amongst the farmsteads of the Hudson Valley region surrounding Albany up into the early part of the 20th century. Thanks for listening to New York, Quebec, and the water route to the center of the world. If you'd like to learn more about the transitional period to English rule, listen to my bonus episode 12, where I describe the Dutch merchant class transformation into landed gentry. Music